Hi and welcome back to the channel and welcome back to our new series. This is the second episode in the Incident Command Simplified series. In this episode, we're gonna concentrate on the initial response and assessment piece of our planning P. We'll talk about that in just a few minutes. Uh, but we're looking specifically today at the organizational structure, how to get set up for long-term operations and how to get set up correctly for success. We'll be right back. First thing we want to talk about is our planning P. And we mentioned that in the, the initial episode for the series, but today we really want to concentrate there and look at how the planning P can be our roadmap, our time clock. It's full of reminders. It can be used as a, a checklist of sorts. There's so many things that it can offer to us for our success in these long-term incidents. The illustration that you see here on the screen is the FEMA version. There's a number of different variations of the planning P. The Coast Guard has their own. Uh, NOAA has their own. There, there's, there's a few different ones out there. But what I want to really make clear is that all of them follow the same basic template. And again, they're all a good framework, a good schedule, a good time clock, a good set of reminders. You see here in the illustration uh, that the planning P is our operational period planning cycle. Another important thing is that it shows the relationship between the sequence of events the meetings that go along with those events and the briefings and work periods uh, that we're gonna, gonna follow throughout the incident. Like we talked about in the previous episode, a lot of folks have a lot of heartburn with so much paperwork, so many meetings, what are they for? That's what we wanna start really concentrating on is looking at those meetings. Now today, again, we're gonna talk more about organizational structure. We're gonna talk more about how to set up that organizational structure for success. And then as we roll into the longer term and the longer periods of our incident, that's gonna help us with our success. As we begin to bring in other people, as we begin to bring in other positions to the, the incident command structure, we'll be ready to start introducing those meetings in the appropriate time frames and use them for the appropriate work. A couple of things before we get into the organizational structure piece, I wanna to talk to you, and if any of you have taken ICS 100 through 400, you've heard the term unity of command. Unity of command, it means simply that regardless of what position I hold in the ICS structure, I have one supervisor. That supervisor has one supervisor, and so on up the line so that we're, we're not answering to multiple people. All that does is breed confusion. Uh, it breeds all kinds of, of problems within our organizational structure. So we need to make sure that any, anyone and everyone, especially people who are gonna hold supervisory roles within the organizational structure, understands unity of command. And then also chain of command. And that's pretty simple. Most of us understand what chain of command is. We talked about unity of command being, I have one supervisor, that person has one supervisor. Well, that establishes essentially the chain of command and how we move information, how we move assignments and so forth through the organizational structure. It's very important that we follow unity of command, but also that we follow chain of command. Without both, again, confusion, safety issues, all kinds of things are gonna come up. Those things are gonna plague our incident. One of the top priorities for us uh, in our incidents, in any incident, is to quickly establish the incident commander. And we really wanna try to establish the long-term incident commander. On a number of our incidents, especially larger incidents, it's not uncommon for the incident commander to change a number of times, especially early in the incident. We have first arriving units that hopefully will establish command, but then as other higher ranking folks or more specialized folks begin to arrive, that, that transfer of command may take place a number of times, again, especially early in the incident. We want to try to establish that long-term, that sort of that permanent incident commander role and who that person is going to be early, early in the incident. The quicker we can do that, the more sustainable our organizational structure is going to be able to be built. 
and we understand that the incident commander's role is not only the overall responsibility for the incident, that, that person is, is, is pretty much on the hook for everything that happens, but also a big responsibility for the incident commander is to keep agency officials in the loop. And again, we're talking about large incidents. Where that comes into play is oftentimes uh, elected officials at the county level, the city level, uh, that kind of thing. And it's important to understand that it's absolutely the responsibility of the incident commander to set up our organizational structure appropriately. Again, we need to try to do that as quickly as we can. We need to try to get our arms around and get our minds around and understand what's going to be needed for the incident. Remember, we're talking about large incidents, but this is, is, is true for even smaller incidents on a day-to-day -day basis. The quicker we can set up that organizational structure and a sustainable organizational structure, the better off we're going to be, and that's going to take us through the long term for the incident. We talked a little bit about span of control in the first episode. Again, we, we need to concentrate heavily, and, and it, that's what we're going to, to concentrate on today in this episode, is maintaining that span of control. And when we lose span of control, what do we do? How do we make that change? How do we catch back up to our span of control? It, it's a quite simple concept, but when you're under fire, it's not as simple as it sounds. So we need to have that, that kind of that slide in the deck. We need to kind of have that muscle memory on how to do that and how to correct that span of control to make ourselves, again, sustainable for the long term. It's important to understand that our organizational structure is 100% scalable, meaning that it, it needs to grow, it needs to expand and contract with the incident. As the incident grows, so does the organizational structure. If the incident starts to scale back, then we need to start to scale back the organizational structure. Today we're gonna to concentrate on the operations section. The reason for that is the operations section is the only one that builds from the bottom up. Most of our other, if, if not all of our other general staff sections build from the top down. In other words, we, we put the leadership in place and then we build that out. Well, the operations section, the tactical resources build from the bottom up. Again, the first arriving unit is by default the incident commander, we understand that. But as other resources begin to, to respond and to begin to arrive on the scene, we have a lots and lots of tactical resources that need to be assigned and they need to be grouped. And that's how we build from the bottom up. This can be very, very complex. But the more we practice, the more we understand how we group things together, how we consolidate types and, and kinds of resources together, and again, have some of that muscle memory, the easier it will be to exercise and execute that during an incident. Now today we'll talk about a lot of things. I'm gonna throw a lot of information at you. The beauty of this format and with YouTube is you can back this up as many times as you need to. You can listen to it as many times as you need to. You can put questions down in the comments. Uh, I'll remind you of our, our Facebook group, uh, it's also called Incident Command Simplified. Feel free to do that. That's Again, that's the beauty of this platform is it's just you and me. Uh, so there's not a, a crowd, there's not a big class. Uh, if you're the type of person that you don't like to ask questions in front of folks, put it in the comments. Again, put it in the, in the Facebook. My email's in the, the description. Uh, you, can, you can send an email any way you want to. So we, we can share, we can exchange uh, thoughts and ideas. Uh, I, can, I can get you answers to questions in that format if that's what you're more comfortable with. So we'll start here with single resources and the definition of a single resource as an individual or a piece of equipment with personnel or a crew or team of individuals with an identified supervisor. And in each one of these levels that we'll talk about, I've got in, you see in, in quotes there, I've got the supervisory level term uh, in, in quotations there. So uh, meaning that for that single resource, what's the name of that supervisory level? And as we go up, we'll talk about the strike teams, task forces, groups, divisions, all of those, so that you'll kind of get used to what the leadership position is called. That, that's important especially as we look into incidents that are multi-jurisdictional, uh, maybe bringing in state and federal level resources, it's important to call those positions the, the correct name. If we get it wrong, is it the end of the world? No, it's not. Uh, but again, we, we want to do it by the numbers. We want to do it right. So I've got that correct uh, term there for you uh, for each one of those positions. 
So again, a single resource here, what we're talking about is a fire truck, an ambulance, a law enforcement officer. Uh, it could be a, a kind of a, a non-traditional type responder, maybe like a, a power truck, a, a gas or utility company uh, type of a resource. There's any number of things that you can think of, a bulldozer, a helicopter, a fixed wing aircraft. It could be any number of things. Single resources, again, an individual, a piece of equipment with personnel, or a crew or team of individuals with an identified supervisor. The next level, and, and I'll, I'll stop here and, and, and explain why I've got the, the, the other levels above in red. Uh, the reason that I've got those kind of redded out there is because we don't have those assigned yet. Remember, we're talking about the operations section builds from the bottom up. Obviously, the incident commander is in place. And as these single resources, and, and we begin to, to group these resources into other, other ways, the incident commander is the oversight. The incident commander is the supervisory role, unless these other supervisory roles that we're gonna talk about have been put into place. That's the whole reason to put them into place because the incident commander, again, we're talking about large incidents. We're talking about incidents where there are a lot of single resources to be grouped together. So we want to get that responsibility or at least the, the division of labor off the incident commander. So it's very, very important that we understand how to put these levels into place, especially if we're the incident commander, so that we can efficiently use those resources. If I've got 50 or 60 single resources on this incident, as an incident commander, I can't keep up with that. There's no way. So I've got to begin to divide it and conquer these resources. So we'll look first here at strike team. The definition of strike team is a set number of resources of the same kind and type that have an established minimum number of personnel, common communications, and a designated leader. The leadership position for that strike team is called a strike team leader. The biggest thing to, to understand here is same kind and type of resource. So if we have an incident where we've got a ton of fire trucks and, and, and we need those fire trucks. Say we got uh, maybe a dozen and the incident calls for that many. So I've got a dozen of, of that resource. I can't as an incident commander or whatever the, the supervisory level is there, that exceeds my span of control. We talked about in the previous episode, a span of control of five to one is, is optimum. So we wanna stay at, at, at least at five to one uh, no more than that, especially for emergency operations. So if I've got a, a number of resources that are the same kind and type, I need to split them up so that I have a manageable slice of that resource under supervision. So again, fire, fire engines are a good example. So if I've got, say, a dozen of them, I can split them up into three strike teams, four in each strike team, that gives me my dozen. Now I've got three strike team leaders, three strike teams of engines with three strike team leaders that now as an incident commander, if that's all the tactical resources I have in the field at this moment, now my, my span of control has went from 12 to one down to three to one. The use of strike teams is very, very popular in wildfire type situations in broad area, wide area type situations where a number of the same resource is needed in a number of different places. Strike teams work pretty well. You can probably think of some other situations where we've got the same type of resource that we've got scattered out through it throughout the incident and across the incident. And again, think about strike teams as a way of simply organizing the, the resource that are, are all the same. Some other examples here, ambulances where we, we may have a mass casualty situation uh, where our, our situation is, is extremely large and we may need four or five ambulances over here, four or five over here, and so on. So we would have a strike team of ambulances to put in those different areas. Law enforcement officers, again, depending on the nature of the work that they're doing, they may be providing perimeter security. We may have a couple of dozen law enforcement officers. So if we've got four or five, five being the, the, the optimum uh, that are working in a, in a same area. We can group those together as a strike team, have a strike team leader for those officers 
And again, we, we, we've got one person that we're calling for those five resources working in that area, but the strike team leader is, is who we're, we're contacting from the command level, ultimately reducing our span of control. And you may say, well, what about situations where we've got a ton of different resources? Um, I, I don't need a dozen fire engines. I only need three or four, but I need them in multiple areas. And I don't need all, all these other resources that you're talking about. I don't need an abundance of the same resource. I need a variation. I need a wide variety of resources. Well, that's where task forces may work better for your incident. And again, we've got to, got to remember that this is flexible and we use what we need. It's modular, we grow it, we shrink it based on the incident, and we also plug and play these types of resources and the way that we group these resources. So here's an example, and let's look at the definition for task force. Any combination of resources assembled to support a specific mission or operational need. A task force will contain resources of different kinds and types with common communications and a designated leader. So let's look at some examples here, and, we, and we've got the leader uh, term down here at the bottom, task force leader. So strike teams and task forces both use the same supervisory leadership term, and that's task force leader, strike team leader, again, because it's simply the, the, kind of the same level in our incident, but it's just a different way of organizing resources. So task force leader and strike team use the leader designation. So a, a good example that we can think of where we might need a, a task force rather than a strike team, uh, the situation here that we talk about, a tornado strikes our town. Uh, there are multiple areas with power lines down, structural collapse, trapped victims, gas leaks, missing persons, fires, injuries, and so forth. So what we may do is we may put a, a team together that addresses multiple types of situations. They travel together, they're under the supervision of a task force leader. Remember, they're different kinds and types of resources combined to do a job. They have common communications but their design is not to do just one thing, but to do multiple things with multiple different types of resources in an efficient type of a setup. So in this situation, we may wanna take a fire engine or, or maybe two, or maybe uh, one type of fire apparatus for firefighting because we've got fire issues here, and then another type of fire apparatus for a rescue situation. So that, that's, that's two of our, our resources that we may want to put in this task force. The other resource we may want to put in there is the utility piece, a, a, a power bucket truck or a gas company representative uh, who's got maps and things like that so they can turn off gas valves, or maybe if it's in a rural area uh, where they can uh, turn off uh, gas cylinders we may also want to include a law enforcement element into this task force. Uh, we've got missing people. Uh, we potentially could have all kinds of situations that where a law enforcement officer would be pretty nice to have with us. And then another good idea for this particular situation would definitely be hopefully a paramedic level, but at least a, a basic life support level ambulance. So you can see we would combine those resources and we may have several of those task forces depending on how wide and how vast our situation is for this tornado situation. We may put multiple task forces together so that we can put those out into those different geographical areas to take care of these type situations. So I wanna talk quickly here about a common practice, and this is something that we need to, to, to do just what it says here. We need to be in the practice of sending our resources to staging areas to be organized. And a lot of times we, we don't do that and we don't think about that in time for it to be terribly, especially in the early stages of the incident, for it to be terribly useful for us. A lot of times we get resources that just dump into the incident and we've got them stacked on top of each other, whereas if we would have thought a little bit ahead, we could have diverted those resources to staging areas until again, we get our mind around what's going on. We get a really good situational picture of the incident. We've got a couple of staging areas maybe where we've got those resources that have come in and then we can begin to strategically bring those in as needed, and again, they potentially have already been organized into strike teams and task forces or, or, or ever how you need them, 
by the stage and area manager. But again, we really need to be in the practice of thinking about our incident. How long is this incident gonna go? We know for a lot of our incidents, when we get there, this is gonna be a long-term deal. We're gonna be here a while. That should trigger something in our mind, like, hey, let, let's, let's back up here. Hang on, let's, let's, let's give a, a, a mental time out here as the incident commander, uh, what, whatever our role is. But for those folks that are getting there early in the incident, let's take a mental time out and, and we, we know we've got resource after resource after resource coming to this incident. There's a ton of stuff coming at me. How am I gonna manage that? Staging areas are a great way to kind of buffer that until I can get my mind around it, get them organized, a good strong staging area manager, they know as soon as those resources start coming in, they're writing down their, or tracking somehow who those resources are, what kind and type of resources they are, and as soon as the incident commander needs something, they can start throwing it at you. But we've got to establish those areas, otherwise we've got all those resources piled in there on us. So once we've organized our resources, and we've got them broken down into manageable chunks of, of resources to be able to use, it's still very, very possible, and it's very common to exceed still the span of control that the incident commander is able to handle. So the next level of supervision, if, if that's the case, if our span of control still needs to be managed further, the next level is groups or divisions. So let's talk about divisions first. A division is an organizational level having the responsibility for operations within a defined geographic area. So divisions are geographic. Very, very important for us to understand. Divisions are geographic. The supervisory level, division supervisor. It's important to understand that a division can simply be a designation on the map uh, for purposes of reference. Uh, in addition to defining the area of responsibility for tactical operations. And then a group is an organizational subdivision established to divide the incident into functional areas of responsibility. So divisions are geographic, groups are functional. And we'll talk about what that means. The supervisor level here, the title there is group supervisor. So division supervisor, group supervisor. So why would we use divisions versus groups? Divisions oftentimes are more applicable uh, when the work to be done is much the same in multiple geographic areas. Think about this, uh, and, and some examples that we've got here, wildfires, where we've got a, a large geographical area, basically the same things going on in all of those areas. We're trying to contain, uh, we may be plowing lines, uh, we may be cutting snags, we may be handling snags, that kind of thing. Uh, flooding is, is another good example. A lot of the same things, evacuation, uh, we may have rescue boats uh, moving around in flooded areas, we may be doing hazmat work. There, there's a lot of different things that could be happening um, in a flooding situation, but a lot of it's gonna be the same thing happening in multiple different areas across a very widespread area. Sometimes it helps to think about divisions being good for kind of square mileage ICS versus square footage ICS. Uh, that's, that's a way to think about it if that helps. And then groups are often more applicable when specific and or specialized functions are required for an incident. Some examples here uh, that we have hazardous materials releases, uh, law enforcement issues like active shooter, hostage situations, mass casualties, uh, industrial accidents, those kinds of things, where the work oftentimes is more focused, it's more specialized, and it, it may or may not be widespread, but typically wouldn't be as large of a geographical area, but instead more technical, more specialized, and more focused type work. And here you see an illustration where we have a group and a division that may overlap. And again, think about what's going on in a division. It's a geographic area. We've got a division supervisor that potentially could be overseeing multiple different things going on in that geographical area. In this illustration, we've got a couple of hazmat situations going on in Division Bravo and Division Charlie but there are no hazmat situations in Division Alpha or Division Delta. So this may drive why we would have a hazmat group 
a little bit smaller complement of resources but very specialized and the hazmat group supervisor would move their resources around within these divisions now again we're talking about a functional group is now overlapping a geographic division what do we do who works for who it's, it's, it's very simple in this situation that hazmat group supervisor because they're kind of fluid and they're moving all around the incident as they move from division to division the first thing they need to do is coordinate make contact with and, and, and do cooperative work with that division supervisor let them know they're there let them know what they what the the work to be done and what the need is there if we've planned properly all of that's spelled out in the incident action plan but it still needs to be communicated when that resource, when that, that hazmat group, uh, whatever resource is being assigned from the hazmat group, enters that division so that there's no confusion and so that the division supervisor is in the loop on what's going on in that geographic area. The next organizational level that we'll talk about is branches. A branch is the organizational level having functional and or and or geographic responsibility for major aspects of the incident. And the supervisory level, the, the title here is branch director. So a, a couple of, of big reasons that we would use branches. Um, and let's talk about the geographic piece. Remember branches can be geographic or functional. So let's look at the geographic first. Uh, so for, we'll, we'll just read along. From the geographic perspective, branches may be used when the number of divisions has reached a number that exceeds the span of control. Again, it goes back to span of control. Why would I put a branch in? Because I've exceeded my span of control. I've got too many divisions. I've got too many groups. Now I have to, I have to organize them yet again. So the example here, I've got eight divisions established. We're two or three operational periods into the incident. Maybe not, maybe only be one. But we've gotten divisions, we've gotten far enough in that we've got multiple divisions. So we've got eight divisions have been established. Uh, that exceeds our span of control. Can't, can't do that. That's eight to one, uh, we, can't, we can't have that. So uh, we need to put a, another level in, the next level being branches. So what we're gonna do here is put two branches in. Uh, two branches will be established with divisions Alpha through Delta will be in branch one and divisions Echo through Hotel will be in branch two. So you see we've, we've gone back to a four to one span of control. We've got two branches, four divisions in each branch. So it's two to one span of control. So for the branch director, it's four to one span of control for the incident commander or whatever the next operational level is, is two to one. So we've got two branches, that makes us two to one. Now, from a functional perspective, it's a little bit different twist. It still could be span of control, simply by numbers. But we, we may have another angle here. Let's, let's read. From a functional perspective, branches may be used when there are a high number of functional groups, purely by numbers, or, or when the nature or the intensity of the work to be performed by these groups rises to the level which would warrant a higher level of functional oversight. Meaning that a couple of examples that we have here, highly technical law enforcement, fire services, EMS uh, provisions, whatever the case may be, those, those folks may be, and it could be any number of things. Those traditional responders are, are a little bit easier for us to get our mind around. But we, when we think about some of the highly technical work that, that our responders may do, we may want to have, when they're heavily functionally engaged, we may want to have that branch oversight for those functional groups simply because of the work that they're doing. Now, this is true as well when we're operating in unified command. We're not going to talk about that yet. We're going to kind of put a pin in that. But under unified command, we may want to have that functional oversight as well. Uh, and again, we'll, we'll get back to that when we get, when we get into the unified command episodes. So the next supervisory level uh, within the operations section is the operations section chief. Uh, so let's, let's look here. The operations section chief, which, which again is the, the supervisory title, has responsibility for supervision of all tactical resources. If the section chief has not yet been assigned, these responsibilities fall to the incident commander. Just like what we've been talking about through, through stacking up through and organizing these resources, we've not had that operations section chief yet throughout what we've been talking about. Now we're, now we're putting in our operations section chief. Why? because our span of control is gonna require it. 
some folks go ahead and what's called front load an operations section chief. And that's okay. But basically what that's saying is they, they plug in an operations section chief in anticipation of having all of those resources and needing to organize those resources in the way that we've just talked about. So the incident commander will say, I'm gonna go ahead and make an operations section chief and let them work that, that span of control situation, work that, that resource organization, work it up to their level. That's fine, but we still need to organize from the bottom up because that's the simplest way and the most efficient way, and it quite frankly is the right way to organize our resources to be as, as efficient as we possibly can. So this is a very quick, down and dirty, simple way of looking at organizing our resources, and I'm gonna try not to move my hand very quickly and all because I think the camera's having a little trouble focusing, but the first arriving is always going to be the incident commander. Understandably, there's a lot of caveats to that. Um, like we said before, the, the command, the incident command role can change a number of times, uh, but we're, we're going to put that up there uh, to talk about our span of control and to look at some of the things uh, and, and again, simply illustrate what we're talking about. So we begin to, to have units that will arrive and each one of these hash marks just simply represents a single resource so we have regardless of what the situation is we may have again it may be a tornado touchdown in our town it may be an airplane crash it could be widespread flooding whatever the case is we have a number of different resources that are going to be showing up to the incident so Initially, the incident commander has got to start using those resources. So once we arrive at, these, at the scene, uh, the incident commander, first arriving unit, ever how you are set up, starts to make some decisions and assignments about how we're going to move forward, these, these resources will begin to, to be used. Uh, so again, we may have upwards of, of a dozen or so resources. So our span of control here that we're showing is already out. We've already exceeded our span of control. Optimum span of control is five to one. So we may have fire trucks, ambulances, law enforcement officers, all kinds of different things, utility, vehicles, depending on what the incident is, we could have a number of different types of resources. So again, we've got to look at how do we categorize those resources? How do we use those resources? Can I split these resources into, we'll say manageable, can I split these resources into three different levels, three different categories, three different, call it whatever you want to, but can I split those up? Can I split them up functionally? Can I split them up geographically? So in this illustration, the incident commander's span of control is three to one, but the incident's getting larger and larger and larger. There's more and more resources that are showing up to the scene. There's more and more categorization that needs to take place. We need to separate these resources out. Could be dozens and dozens. But in this situation, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven groups of resources. So our first level here for the single resources, our first level here, and hopefully you're sitting there going, hey, don't call them groups and divisions, and you're right. These would be strike teams and task forces. If we're using resources in that way, we need to be thinking about and we need to kind of train ourselves to use strike teams and task forces. We're not used to that, most of us. So we typically don't use resources in that way. But remember, we're talking about a large, large incident here and strike teams and task forces can be very, very convenient when you've got high, high numbers of resources coming into your incident. Don't forget your staging areas as well. Let that staging area manager be a, an assistant to you to help you group these resources in that way so that when you get ready to tactically use them in the field, they're ready to roll. In this situation though, all these strike teams and or task forces are working. So we'll just, we'll just say these are strike teams or task forces. That's the way that we've grouped those single resources. But my span of control is seven to one. That's not gonna work. We can't do that. 
it's too many. So what we have to come in here and do is either geographically or functionally divide this incident once again. So moving up to the next level, each one of these sticks represents this because we're building a structure. We're building an organizational structure. So as the IC, I may say, for right now, in the incident where I am right now, this may change, but for right now, I want to divide this incident into geographic divisions. And I'm going to say that I'm doing division alpha. So we'll say divisions over here. Division alpha and division bravo. And these resources are assigned, excuse me, strike teams and task forces are assigned to alpha. These are assigned to bravo. So now as an incident commander, and I'll draw that as a dotted line, as an incident commander for the tactical resources that are assigned to this incident, as the incident commander, my, my span of control went back to two to one. And my division supervisors have a span of control in alpha of three to one and in Bravo of four to one. Is that acceptable? Yes, it is. As we grow and more and more things are needed, more and more assignments are made, the intensity and the complexity of the incident grows and grows and grows. I may have to put in a, a division Charlie, a division Delta, and so on. Once I exceed five divisions, my, my span of control is lost again if I exceed five divisions. And let's just, we'll just say that the, the board goes on that way. And we'll just say we've got Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta, Echo, uh, Foxtrot and, and on down the line, we've got more than, than we can handle. So we have to put in the next level, which would be branches. And I may say branch one in, in the illustration that we talked about earlier and branch two. And Alpha, Bravo, Charlie and Delta would answer to branch one. Echo, Foxtrot, Golf, and Hotel would answer to branch two. Again, remember the, the board's going that way. So that's where we would put in our branches. Now, let's back up a little bit. Now that we understand and we've seen that, let's back up a little bit and look at a common practice that a lot of folks will do the incident commander will say early in the in the incident is I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and put in an operations section chief. I know that this is going to get big. I know that it's going to be super heavy. It's going to be complex. I know that eventually I'm going to need an operations section chief. I'm going to go ahead and put it in there. That's called front loading. That's okay. That, that's fine. It, it kind of doesn't follow the rule for manageable span of control and organizing our resources from the bottom up, but the incident commanders made a pretty smart move there and said, look, from a tactical resource standpoint, I've got my hands full. I, I need to go ahead and put that operations section chief in there and let that person supervise those tactical resources get that done because I'm going to have a planning section chief I've got to put in here. I'm going to have a ton of logistics. I'm going to have to put a logistics section chief. I'm going to put a finance and admin section chief. I'm going to have a safety officer answering to me. I'm going to have a PIO answering to me. I'm going to have my own span of control issues because of all of this other stuff as the incident commander that I've got going for me. So why not go ahead and put that operations section chief in early? There's nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying that, that it's wrong. I'm just saying that it, it's, it's a, a way to do it, um, if that's the way that you choose to do it. A lot of people do this. A lot of people are very successful in doing it this way because it goes, it goes ahead and gets that, that piece, that, that organizational structure piece in there and lets the, the, the organizational 
lets the resources build to that point. So from a tactical perspective, it kind of replaces the incident commander and allows the incident commander to focus on the big picture of the incident. So just to recap a little bit, we've looked at this a couple of different ways. Uh, we've talked about and we've looked at the organizational chart. We've looked at the board uh, and, and how we just simply take and, and plug those sticks and boxes in and how we stack of the organizational structure to, to be correct and to be efficient for us. I want to remind you, rewind this as many times as you need to. Put as many questions and comments in, in the comments box as you need to. Send me emails. We'll talk this out. If you're still having trouble getting your mind around it, that's totally understandable. We want you to get a good understanding so that you can begin to build a team that can help do this on these large incidents. You need personnel, you need somebody looking over your shoulder helping you organize these resources. A good incident commander can't do it all. A great incident commander can't do it all. A great op section chief can't do it all. You need some help. And that's where enlisting some of these other sections, specifically the planning section, and we're gonna get into that in, in multiple of our other episodes, but we'll get into how can we have some assistance with organizing those resources? How can we plug someone in? And if you look back at the organizational structure, that org chart uh, that we had, it's the resource unit. That's where we have that oversight and that assistance. It's in a, a whole nother section. It's somebody that's not tactically engaged. They can kind of be that 10,000 foot view and help us. And quite frankly, they're the ones that are gonna be tracking the resources anyway on paper. Uh, they're the ones that are gonna be rostering all of our resources anyway. So why not plug them in early? Why not put them in place early to help us get that organizational structure hammered out? Don't forget to, to uh, like and subscribe. The subscribe button's on one, one corner or the other, or you may have to, to scroll up a little bit to hit the big blue, excuse me, <laughs> the big red subscribe button. Um, so make sure that you uh, go to Facebook and, uh, and look for our Facebook group. There. It's also called Incident Command Simplified. Our next episode, uh, we're gonna look at, just like what we talked about a few, few seconds ago, we're gonna look a little more broadly across the organizational structure. What are some of the other things that can help the things that we've talked about here today? What are the other support mechanisms for that organizational structure, for those tactical resources? What are some of those support mechanisms and kind of the who does what? Thank you for being here. We'll see you next time.